Um, the tools and tool sets, do they tend to be uh, owned individually or are groups owning and keeping tool sets? Do they, do they share tools and to tool sets? Depends on your definition of ownership, uh, I think, and we'd have, to, we'd have to be very precise about that. But in the study that I referred to about preferences for particular combinations of hammers and anvils, those are individual preferences, but, they, but they're not exclusive ownership or exclusive access. No. Thank you very much. You're welcome. We have a, a question here. If I could state your name, please. Andy White and uh, St. Andrews. Uh, I was interested, uh, when you were talking about scavenging, uh, yeah. you sort of set it aside rather, rather, rather quickly and said, well, chimpanzees can't tell us much about that. Uh, but in fact, although, of course, you know, absence of evidence, as we say, you know, isn't evidence of absence, when you've got something like 10,000 hours at one yeah. field site and across the field sites, tens of thousands of hours, it does seem to be telling us that there's something uh, very, perhaps, unprimate-like about scavenging, even when you're so keen on meat as a chimpanzee is. And so, given the popularity of you know, scavenging hypotheses uh, about, about uh, hominin origins, perhaps this is telling us something uh, important, that, that particular absence. And I wonder if you had any ideas about you know, why it should be so. I and mean, I've seen baboons out on the savanna give a wide berth to a lion to lion kills, and that, that seems pre pretty obvious. That, that's a very dangerous place. But I wondered if, if more generally you have any notions about that. Because in the face of it, it seems perhaps a bit surprising. You've got a very keen predator avoiding scavenging, apparently. I think we'd have to go in, well, to answer it properly, we'd need to go into to what scavenging amounts to. Uh, the, and sometimes it's the, the, the old story of exceptions proving the rule. Exceptions may be when chimpanzees pirate freshly kill prey from known predators, and those are predators whom they can displace. So it may not, might not be a lion, but it could be baboons who've killed a bushbuck fawn, and then chimpanzees can take uh, that fawn away. And in a certain sense, that's Im immediate scavenging. If we're talking about carrion or about um, carnivore killed, particularly social carnivore killed, then these issues come up with regard to, to risk taking. And I, I think what has always been the case is that we have needed to do more studies of the predators that are sympatric with the apes in the circumstances where they are sympatric and, and look at the pot potential for interaction. And this, I'll admit, we've not done enough of that as primatologists. We've been a bit too blinkered, I think, at times, just looking at our, at our apes. Um, Julia Lee Thorpe. Um, um, Bill, you mentioned something about, uh, again in passing, you said something about microware uh, on tools. I wondered if you could perhaps say a little bit more about it. In particular, are you finding any sorts of uh, damage patterns that fit particular activities that uh, might be useful in future? Well, one thing that's come out of some experimental study that a PhD student of mine is doing is that the pitting that is characteristic of anvils, which creates eventually a, a recognizable depression, actually occurs fairly quickly. It occurs much more quickly, I think, than we might have thought. So there's an example of how something can occur um, in a much shorter time frame. I think if you can combine those kinds of characteristic wear patterns with, in some cases, recovery of organic residues, as has been done with the starch, the starch, mod, uh, starch grains, from those same hammers and anvils, then you're, you've got the potential to put those together and, and reconstruct the behavior and, and, and the function. Ray Heaton from London. Um, I realize there's no um, ideas that chimps actually store food, but I'm very interested in this idea of moving food, and particularly the picnics in the cave that you mentioned. You know, we're all familiar with the pictures of Jane Goodall's chimps picking up as many bananas and unable to carry them, but I wonder if this might even lead to development of some uh, some transport method, if not indeed a storage way. I know that, uh, I know. Well, if, if you're an eat-as-you-go forager and if you have uh, perishable food, then there's no reason to carry food uh, unless there are other issues like security. So that if you feed from something that's found on the ground, but it's more secure to stay, uh, to spend time in the trees, 
then obviously taking something from the ground to the trees is, is a sensible form of movement. As far as storage is concerned, um, there are a few cases where it would be useful to have a container to at least assemble um, and, and to some extent curate food items. Uh, palm nuts are a good example. Palm nuts actually last a, a fair amount of time. And if you could assemble them and accumulate them, uh, one of the, the instructive things that we see with the nutcracking is that trips back and forth between the palm tree and the, and the anvil are limited by, by what you can carry. Marta Lar. Hi, Bill. Thank you for that. Can you ask me the, your biggest point is about the last common ancestor? And we can keep going about what chimps do or not do, but that's the point you were making about the behaviors of possible behaviors of the last common ancestor. And in your final hypothesis, you were saying we could, uh, or one real possibility is to attribute these behaviors to the last common ancestor because it would be um, non-parsimonious, I guess, to imagine that they evolved again in the two sister lineages. Could you tell us a little bit, if you think, the entire package is necessary, if there are some behaviors of that list that you are more confident that actually have a very long evolutionary history than others, whether there is some, some that are more likely to be convergent than others? If any. Well, uh, I, I, that would take a bit of time, but, but for a couple of examples. Um, shelter construction in the form of sleeping platforms is something that occurs in all great apes, both Asian and African, and so presumably has a deep history, unless you're going to have to have a lot of independent convergences. Another way to look at it would be which of those patterns are universals across all ecotypes. That is, things that come up whether they are living in woodlands and forests in mixed mosaic habitats, including grassland and so on. And presumably, those are the fairly robust ones that are not ecologically dependent, at least not ecologically dependent on, on vegetation. And I think those are the ones that one would want to pursue, because then we would want to explain why are the ones that are not universal varied, and when do they crop up and when do they not crop up? And then functionally, that might give us some idea as to time depth. But it remains an inferential exercise. I mean, it remains a probabilistic exercise. There are things that could be done, and I, and I throw this out as a kind of um, example by invitation. I, I'm not aware that anyone has looked at the dental microware on chimpanzees who not only have known diets, that is, we know what that population eats specifically, but on individual chimpanzees about whom we knew as they were living chimpanzees, uh, what, what they actually ate. And because we have individual food preferences and populational differences in food, we'd actually be much more precise. Uh, and so that would be a, a good area for paleoanthropologists and primatologists uh, to collaborate and to see to what extent some of these important points that are made about evolution of diet in hominins and apes uh, might be revealed by that. Uh, Chris Stringer. Um, Comparing now chimpanzees and gorillas, um, how much are the differences between them due to the lack of comparable data on gorillas? Do you think if we have more gorilla data, there will be greater similarities? And if not, um, do you think that can tell us evolutionary lessons about the common ancestor? I'm not a gorilla person, and I won't pretend to be, but I can say that uh, straight away I think there's some obvious problems. One is. Most of what we think we know about gorillas are based on a highly abnormal form, the mountain gorilla, right, where we got the good behavioral data early on, but it turns out to look stranger and stranger with regard to the other 99% of gorillas in Africa. Second is I'm only aware of one fully habituated population of Western Island gorillas, and, and that's the Mundika population, which is still in its early days. So any, any comparisons that I would try to draw at this point would be based on Apples, I mean, an apples and oranges type comparison because the gorillas wouldn't have the comparable depth and breadth of data set to contribute to that. And then finally, there's the third thing which I have to admit, which is that I showed you eight study sites, but almost all of those cases, those are study sites where chimpanzees are not sympathetic with gorillas. So the ideal study site that we would want to answer your question would be the one where the chimpanzees and gorillas are in the same forest at the same time 
competing or not over the same resources, and then we could draw those comparisons.